We are back in the big hills today, and I have a timely episode to share visual content about the different approaches to downhill riding if you find yourself on steep winding roads with blind curves that dive down beyond the 15 to 25% gradients. Let's dive into the physics behind downhill cycling and how it can relate to your riding technique for maximum control. First up, let's talk about the center of gravity, COG. The center of gravity is the point where the entire weight of the system can be considered to act. When you're riding downhill fast, the position of your center of gravity plays a crucial role in maintaining control. By adjusting your posture and shifting your weight relative to the ground, you can control the stability and maneuverability of your bike. When you lean back and shift more weight towards the rear wheel, are you, you are essentially lowering your center of gravity. This helps in increasing traction on the rear wheel, Hello. providing better control, especially when you're negotiating tight turns or navigating rough terrain. This is why you might find yourself holding the handlebar drops of your road bike, going low close to the top tube of the frame and sliding your weight to the rear wheel. It's all about manipulating your center of gravity for optimal control. Now let's talk about weight distribution. You're right in thinking that having more weight at the back can enhance control. This is because it helps in keeping the rear wheel grounded, aiding in stability and preventing skidding or loss of control. Like moving your weight sort of low, but to the back of the bike. And what I like to look at is your feet, because it kind of shows you where your hips are. And that's what I think about your weight. So as you drop in, if you just drop your heels, your hips and your weight will go to the back of the bike. But all you're really doing now is maintaining your weight still in the middle of the bike, because the bike's tipping up. You know, if you left it up where it was before, the weight would go up towards the bars. And that's what you don't want to do on something steep. You've got to get low to the back of the bike. And really, you sort of, the front wheel does get light, even though I'm saying your weight is standing in the middle, your front wheel just basically is further away from you. So it will get a bit light. And that's where you've got to be a bit careful with the uh, inputs to the front tire. So braking and steering, I'm trying to be as careful as I can. So if that front wheel slips, I'm in trouble. If the back wheel slips, I'm kind of okay. So. I'll actually start to use my rear brake with a bit more force. So the rear tire becomes the anchor of the bike and I'll start easing off the front brake, especially when it comes to corners, to make sure that front tire is gripping. Other than that, you need both brakes pretty much equally. Don't forget to keep your head up as well, because it can get a bit scary dropping in something steep and thinking about what you're trying to do with your weight, with your braking, all those things. But it's often the case that you kind of, you'll get around the steep thing, but it's the thing afterwards. So this is a really good example. I've got two steep turns here, so I really need to be looking at where I want to be on the exit of these corners. It's like having a strong foundation to support your movements and maneuvers. Examine the engineering of sports cars. The principle of center of gravity and weight distribution also plays a vital role. Sports cars are typically designed to have a low center of gravity by positioning their engines and other heavy components closer to the ground. This low center of gravity enhances stability, reduces body roll during cornering, and improves overall handling performance. Additionally, wider tires at the back of sports cars help in enhancing traction for better acceleration and control, especially in high-speed situations. So the next time you hit the downhill on your bike, remember to leverage your understanding of physics. Adjust your center of gravity, manipulate weight distribution, and take cues from sports cars to enhance your control and performance. But you also have to keep in mind that downhill riding should be treated equally in training time, like you would spend time riding on flat roads and increasing your wattage. Do not irresponsibly copy and paste what you see here. Practice it. Downhill riding is a skill and art. No wonder there is a sport dedicated to world championship downhill skiers and downhill mountain bike events. It's because it's a skill to train. Our destination today will be in Buso Buso in Laurel Batangas. I've never been there before, but Nikki recommended that it's one of those landmark must visit. It's a landmark because most important cycling events take place here because of its 25% mythical gradient. We start in Talisay Tall Lake after that long 12 kilometer downhill. From here you can clearly see the tall volcano, world famous for its elevation. It's considered the smallest volcano in the world.
From here, it's a 25 kilometer straight shot from the bottom of Sampala climb all the way to Buso Buso, and the flat section of roads have recently been well repaired and widened. Recent government infrastructure initiatives have widened these roads, making it very, very good for cyclists to use. Decades ago, when I was younger, these roads were really, really narrow, and you would have to dodge tricycles and jeeps and buses and cars, so I'm fairly surprised how well maintained and the state of rehabilitation. As we go along this section of road around Tall Lake, we will approach the first climb of the day. And this climb, according to Nikki, is around 18% in gradient. Nikki and Tom speed away because they have so much more firepower in the legs. When we climb, the number one rule is never race beyond your fitness, ride your pace. This is one of the number one rule that we advise our newbies. Manage your effort, manage your ride. If you need to walk, there's nothing wrong with that. Do not concern yourself with speed, any speed as long as you just finish it. Rule of thumb. If we are on a community group ride, we always practice a no drop ride rule. If Tom and Nikki finish ahead of me, they will have the courtesy to slow down or wait in the summit. It's just a form of courtesy that we extend to all our members, just to keep them encouraged and motivated. We saw a lot of people walking the steep slopes, so I think that's an evidence of how steep this section is. This section of road is very challenging, but surprisingly, Tom, even though he is three times my weight, his technique and his skill level is top notch. He is able to manage challenging first climb in flying colors. I mean, a lot of people get surprised how the type of rider like Tom can ride at this level. Julie also climbed smoothly and showed her own climbing skills, considering these two riders come from different backgrounds. So as for me, I just had to keep grinding. It's a huge disadvantage if you have a large time trial crank. This bike is fitted with a single 58 tooth chain ring, but you never make that an excuse. Just manage it. And when you manage it, you're going to survive the ride because part of the training is really about making sure your body adapts to the stresses. So even though there are numerous climbs along the way, going to Buso Buso, all you have to do is manage your effort. The way you hold the bike dictates how you climb. And if you notice, the more difficult the gradient becomes, the more that you have to really focus on your posture. I try my best not to swing from side to side or else I'm going to lose a lot of torque. We get to pass some of our friends, riders who are also trying to conquer this tall loop. And one of the things that I learned in three decades of cycling is posture and technique is more important than speed. Speed is a product of proper technique. Speed is a product of proper posture. And the way you hold the handlebar literally dictates if you can engage your core muscles. In true form, Tom and Nikki were courteous, not sprint away. So I was able to catch up when the gradients became manageable at 10%, 9%. This one I can manage even with a single chain ring. But as soon as we reached the start of the downhill at Buso Buso, everything started to really go. So if you can see the map, we are here now at the summit. 
this is the same downhill that I will have to tackle when we make a U-turn. Tom! Tom, tara! Just one climb, one climb! This downhill is a little bit fast and treacherous. 22% at the top, 25% at the bottom. This is when the discussion about center of gravity, putting all the weight at the back, makes the bike a little bit more controllable. Remember, the roads are not smooth asphalt, so the more that you put weight at the back, the easier tackling this descent easier. You don't necessarily have to do our descending posture. It's just me and Tom, just because we're very comfortable on this posture. In your case, you can stay seated on the saddle. Just stay as low as possible and put your weight at the back, and you'll be able to manage. And that's that. And as soon as we reach the bottom of the downhill, we make a U-turn here, reverse it, do it all over again. But this time, that downhill becomes the uphill. This store became our landmark U-turn. But before we started to ride back up, we had to cool off the brakes. I mean, the brakes really worked so hard. Descending more than 70 to 80 kilometers per hour require a lot of friction braking to safely halt our speed in the shortest distance possible. We had to cool the discs off. They were steaming hot. 160 millimeter rotors are still advisable when you're as heavy as Tom. This one he's using 140 millimeter rotors. Hence he had to really overcook them. And I think today he had to upgrade to 160 rotors. We started our ascent and the first part of the climb is the most difficult part. That's what I discovered. It immediately goes up to 25%. It's not easy, but again you can manage it by calculating your effort focusing on your posture using your torque technique by not relying solely on your quads or else they will instantly get cooked. You can see from the background how steep the initial ramp is. 25% immediately and the rest of the way is 22%. I had a hard time in the first section because it's 25%. I almost took out Tom because I was almost standing still. I think my speed here was around two to five kilometers per hour and I had to just let Tom overtake. So he immediately sprinted ahead of me. His acceleration was possible because he had a small chain ring. As for myself, I had to be patient and go through the first 25% and 22% section and patiently, just patiently, pedal my way up to close the gap to top. When you encounter long ascents, like this one, what I found out was the mental factor. Aside from physical, absolutely, it's very difficult. But what we've seen all throughout the years, it's really more mental. The moment that you think about anxiety, you get a panic attack, you'll literally stop. This is the most important part. Even if you are having difficulty trying to rotate those pedals as long as you focus, put a lot of emphasis on how you execute every pedal stroke each pedal stroke becomes very, very important. And the next thing you know, if you just focus on that, you will get your groove on. Everything starts to work together again. Plenty. It is the moment when I realized I've gone through the 25%. Now it's a little bit more manageable. This is the moment that I decided to close the gap to Tom, and we have to just do it slowly. Creep up quietly. Now we're side by side, slowly going up slowly overtake and all you got to do now is just keep on moving do not look back the more that you look back the more you will lose momentum this is where you lose a lot of torque
So the moment that you get into this section, you have to commit. The more that you think about it, the more that you're going to lose a lot of power, the more that you're going to lose a lot of torque. Commitment and not questioning it is the most important part. Kudos to Tom. I mean, for his size, he was able to really manage going up. This is why a lot of people consider Tom as an outlier and give hope to a lot of our big riders. I mean, considering I am three times less his weight, he is able to put a lot of power. This is very good evidence that if you focus on your skill, technique, and put a lot of emphasis on yourself, you'll do a lot. Talk to me, guys. Talk to me. <laughs> That was hard. That was like 21% on a 58, 58.32. So I guess this is one of those famous places where people stop over because it's an insane gradient. Well, I thought that was our goner when you made that adjustment. Ah, <laughs> dude, we're gonna die. After consuming a lot of water and taking a few minutes of rest at the summit, we proceeded back to the Sampalak climb with our finish at Tagaite Ridge. To get there, we had to pass through the brand new roads of Laurel on the side of the lake. The beautiful asphalt roads were a welcome sight to me with Tom riding behind, followed by Julie, Richie, and then Nikki. Today was a really good sunny day. The summer season officially ended and everything already felt cooler than usual. On the left side of the road, you could see 7-Eleven. This is the landmark that leads you up to the legendary Blackwall 30% grade climb. However, Today we decided not to go to Blackwall. Instead, we went straight back to where we started, which was equivalent to at least 25 kilometers of rolling asphalt roads. Here, we were able to do a lot of baseline riding, drafting, and paceline choreography. This type of riding require a lot of group etiquette awareness. It's one of the things that every newbie learns in CRZ as part of their certification process. When encountering traffic like this, you cannot panic. No shouting. In CRZ Community Ride, part of the etiquette is to never shout profanity to tricycle drivers, public transport, or even pedestrians. We have to maintain courtesy and politeness. We always have to be reminded that we are guests in their hometown. Remember, it's not their wish to harm us. We just have to make sure that they are aware of your impending arrival. Sometimes they misjudge how fast cyclists can go, just like this small downhill. Very often, motorists never realize that we can go as fast as 50 to 60 kilometers per hour. It's up to us to practice defensive riding. If we stay courteous, I think we can develop the culture where cyclist and motorist are able to respect each other. How cool is that if we can all share this brand new roads that have recently popped up all over the Philippines?
Back in the days when I was younger, I never had the chance to really enjoy these back roads because it was really, really sketchy to go high speeds. To be able to ride these magnificent roads is a huge blessing to all road cyclists. We just have to be very aware and proactive in sharing. After 25 kilometers of riding, we finally approach the intersection that leads us back to the Sampalot climb. L, this climb is 12 kilometers long. As soon as you see this landmark with the public school on the left, the lake on the right, this is the moment of anticipation. As soon as you turn left, the incline immediately starts and become uninterrupted for the next five kilometers. This sector consists of the most brutal slopes that tempt you to stop and reflect on your life choices. The first five kilometers of this climb is exposed to the sun. The anxiety was subdued for a brief moment when we saw and met a lot of riders tackling the slopes today. I think everyone was training today in the slopes of Sampaloc because of the quality of the road. I think every weekend everyone is now training here. Tom stayed with my pace while Nikki and Julie stayed behind with their own pace. They just had to ride their own effort. I had to smartly manage this 58 tooth chain ring and the only way I can do this is to patiently rotate the pedals one at a time without accelerating or else it's just going to hurt. As we cover the first few meters, we get to encounter some of key switchbacks. Whenever you encounter a switchback like the one approaching now, there's a technique where you just have to go to the shallow side of the road. In this instance, we go to the yellow line. But before you do that, you have to make sure that the traffic is clear. Going through the shallower part of the climb would be very useful and allows you to go up without spiking your heart rate. From a distance, we find our friends who were up on the road and kindly became our visual targets. Sometimes when you are confronted by a climb that is 12 kilometers long, your number one competition is your mental sanity. It's so easy to get reminded how far the finish is and very often you are tempted to just stop the pain and slow down. But for this challenge, we try to use riders ahead of us as visual magnets. When you slowly target individuals in the front, it gives you a little bit of, you can say, entertainment. It's not really racing your friends, it's just really about refocusing your attention away from the pain. The best lessons that I learned in my three decades of cycling is the value of patience and playing the long game. It does not help if you keep on accelerating or standing up or moving from side to side sprinting unnecessarily just like our friend. This habit will spike your heart rate. The next thing you know, you find yourself blowing up and sitting on the side of the road. So before that even happens, try to decide on keeping a very steady effort. Let your friends race in front. As soon as your friends realize that it's still a long way to go, standing up and sprinting on those really steep switchbacks will burn your matches. You blow up. As soon as you burn up, it's so hard to recover from those efforts. The more that you keep on accelerating, 
the more you will hate the idea that there's still nine kilometers to go. Once that lactic acid hits your legs, you're done, and the only way you can remedy that difficulty is for you to slow down or stop. As we continue to ascend, remembering proper posture and technique is vital in surviving the climb rather than speed alone. Enjoying the journey and pacing oneself is more important, similar to how Tom utilizes proper technique and strength management in his climbs. We look forward to meeting you at the top in the next 10 minutes, where we will engage in a lead out game for the final three kilometers. Remember your posture and your technique plays a major role on how you can survive. To finish a climb, it doesn't mean that you have to be fast. All you have to do is just ride your own pace. Even though Tom is a heavyweight, he knows the proper technique and manages his own limited strength. So if you can do that, you'll enjoy every single climb, every single ride. Here is a quick trivia that most cyclists are not aware of. In a typical road stage of the Tour de France, a significant portion of the effort is ridden in a moderate level of intensity, typically around 70 to 80% of an individual's maximum heart rate or their functional threshold power, FTP. This approach is strategic and rooted in the physiology and tactics of professional cycling. The main reason behind spending a considerable amount of time in zone three during a road stage is to establish a sustainable pace that allows the riders to conserve energy for the critical phases of the race. The, by riding predominantly in zone three, cyclists can maintain a relatively high pace while avoiding excessive fatigue that can lead to burnout later in the stage. Endurance plays a crucial role in multi-stage races and pacing oneself smartly is key to ensuring consistent performance over your own long rides like Audax, where the most popular distances in the Philippines are the 400 kilometers and now the 600 kilometer super randonneur. Furthermore, keeping wattage at a minimum in the early part of a stage is a strategic move to preserve energy reserves for crucial moments later in the ride. Cycling is a sport where timing and tactical awareness are paramount, especially in events as demanding as the Audax 600. By riding at a controlled pace early on, riders can save their explosive efforts for key points in the stage such as climbs or the final push to the finish. This strategic allocation of energy allows cyclists to make decisive moves when it matters most, leveraging their power output for maximum impact and increasing their chances of success. Top professional cyclists have mastered the art of conquering long, steep climbs, showcasing their exceptional physical and mental endurance. When faced with the challenge of tackling arduous ascents, these athletes employ various strategies to optimize their performance and achieve peak explosiveness in the crucial final kilometers. One key aspect of their approach is efficient effort management. This same skill is something weekend warriors like you and me, Nikki or Julie, can master to carefully gauge our pace throughout the climb Balancing the need to exert just enough power to maintain momentum with the imperative of conserving energy for the demanding final push instead of constantly standing and sprinting unnecessarily. By pacing effectively, we ensure that we can sustain a high level of performance over extended periods regardless of your background or fitness level. And this is crucial for conquering prolonged ascents. Timing is another critical factor in the arsenal of top cyclists when tackling steep climbs that your typical mom and dads can also employ on group rides. These elite athletes strategically plan their energy expenditure, aiming to reach their maximum explosiveness precisely when it matters most in the last three kilometers of the climb. By meticulously calculating their efforts and conserving energy during the earlier stages, they set themselves up for a powerful surge towards the finish, leaving their competitors trailing in their wake. This same game is an integral part of our ride to keep everyone engaged and experience the thrill of being a weekend tour rider. 
it becomes an exciting coffee table conversation guaranteed to keep everyone part of the story with their specific roles to play. As busy working professionals with household responsibilities plus office work stress, we can use cycling as a good alternative to mental and energy boosting drug. To keep us excited, we can combine discipline and experience that we have become accustomed to on managing daily tasks. Moms and dads can now exhibit a masterful approach to managing long, steep climbs. This ability to synchronize effort and timing to unleash our limited full potential in the final kilometers showcases the unparalleled skill and athleticism that can define us on the grueling mountainous weekend rides that we can always claim on Strava as our prestigious version of a world championships and have bragging rights that can last us for the next weekend. Come on, Diket! Come on, come on, come on. Yeah, 200 meters to go, huh? Alright, 300 meters to go. Tom, where are you? Behind you, left. Okay. Stay with me. Right then, let's go. Let's go. Go, 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 Tom. Go. Workout done. Wow, that was a super cool sprint. <laughs> Key? Oh, I forgot to take that video. That's okay, we got it. 
Oh, you have a team. Wow. Yeah, my team's here. Good job, man. Wow, that was a good work. Okay. Hello guys, welcome to my vlogs. All good. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Try all you can. One more. Perfect. Okay. Bye. Right, huh? So, did you say hello? <laughs> hello, 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 vlog. Welcome to my guys. Bye See bye. you. Thank you. Bye, bye. 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 Coach, I coach. <laughs> bye. I send. Can you pack it in, Anna? Come on, okay. Uh, all our friends from the Middle East at Doha, maybe one day, uh, we're gonna be visiting you. Yeah, we're supposed to be going this year, but uh, a lot of things uh, recently happened. Good news, so next time we're gonna be there. One, two, three. See, boys, so this is the uh, elite coffee drinker. <laughs> see you, man. All right, see you. Look at those legs! We should ride next time. How long will we be here? Uh, until 28. Until 28. Just in case, on Wednesday, there's a ride in Tagaytay. It's like a... Just in case, you're there. How in order? Mo? Ramen na? That's oh. it? Are you on a day yet? This is a regular one. Is there... Is there... Uh, Kamsu sauce? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, boys. Cycling transcends boundaries and unites us in a language of shared passion. It's a world where smiles and good vibes have the power to transform entire days, creating connections that go beyond background or status. A simple hello or wave can brighten someone's day and foster a sense of community among strangers. Through cycling, I've discovered the beauty of diverse cultures and learned to appreciate the richness they bring to our lives. It has shown me that sports aren't just about cutthroat competition, but can also serve as a platform for building communities and fostering understanding. In a time when social interactions were limited due to COVID lockdowns, the value of face-to-face -face friendships became even more evident. We realize the significance of these connections only when they are absent. Cycling has allowed me to embrace this truth and cherish every moment of togetherness. Let's remember that life is a journey best enjoyed in the company of others. So spread kindness, share your passion for cycling, and let's continue to build a world where every hello and every pedal stroke brings us closer together. Cycling Club. Thank you for joining me on this cycling journey. I hope you've enjoyed and learned something valuable from my vlogs. If you found them insightful, don't hesitate to share with your friends. Remember, cycling is more than just a sport. It's a lifestyle that transcends age. Together, we can cultivate a positive culture by embracing simplicity and focusing on personal growth. It's not about the brand, but about maximizing your potential. Stay connected with us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube for more inspiring content. Keep pedaling towards a brighter future.
Gardien de ce tour de France, c'est lui, le coureur de Danois. Le Lyon XL en présence de Daniel Go, Madame Robert de Paris et de Michel Mathieu, directeur général de la Congratulations, Hidalgo, the mayor of Paris, alongside Michel Mathieu, the general manager of the It's because of you, Tom. Thank you very much. This guy is a good guy, guys. Again, just to celebrating the moment here every single day, telling us, you know, we still have a few more stages. There's still, we have to cut the finish line. We have to go all the way. You are here now. You've made it all the way. On top of the world. Tout au long du parcours, le Danemark est eh bien nouvelle nation très forte du cyclisme international. Give it up for the Bravo Man 40 to 49 age group. These are the OGs. Nice one, congrats, congrats guys. All right, here we go, moving along, 30 to 39. Fair play, man. Fair play.